welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today, we are really excited to have Golden Globe nominee, Emmy nominee actress Patricia Richardson, who you will remember as Jill from On Home Improvement, The Mom. But she is in a great movie that is actually a sequel called Chantilly Bridge. It is a sequel to Chantilly Lace, and we are going to talk all about it. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to tell your audience, which is really the perfect audience for our movie, um, about this movie. Because um, unfortunately, our distributors didn't do any advertising at all. In fact, they didn't give us a, a theater in New York. And we only had a theater in New York because a friend of Linda's got us into the uh, Angelica Village East. And then we extended because we did so well uh, the first week. And we did better. There were 11 films there. We were number one the first weekend and number two the whole rest of the week. And people love it. So if you have any doubts about watching it, we didn't get to have the really big reviewers come, but there are a few uh, reviews there and mostly mixed to good. And the audience reviews are fantastic. We're, I think, at 96 percent you know, mm -hmm. uh, Rotten Tomatoes for the audience reviews. And and we have been surprised to find that men are like crying at the end. That <laughs> are really okay. moved by it. I, I don't know if it's because of the particular storylines that came in at the end and they all have somebody maybe who they're dealing with that or um, whether it has to do with their wives their girl, or whether it's because the movie is so um, universally about the importance of friendships and how lucky you are if you have friendships that go back to your early life and that you have stayed, that you've worked on, you've worked on that friendship and kept it. That's one of the things that I think Helen's character talks about, Helen Slater's character talks about later, is that friendship is like a romance. It's like any relationship. Sometimes it takes a lot of work, you know, and forgiveness and yeah, stuff like that, which oh, I'm yes. kind of having to go through right now. But <laughs> Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, it's, I am very unfortunate and I really envied the characters in this movie because um, my parents were Navy and, um, and then my dad was just successful and getting better jobs and we were constantly moving. I never went to one school longer than two years in my life. And so I pretty much lost touch. Uh, even high school, it was like broken up in the middle and we moved, you know, half the country away. And so I have a couple of friends from that last high school that I still see and talk to and did theater with back then. We all got into theater together uh, those last two years in high school. And so I have a few of those and then a few from college, which was down there also SMU. But nothing like what these women in this film have, which is since childhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then they kept up. Now, when the movie first starts, I don't think they've seen each other since Joe Beth's character died. Now, Joe Beth Williams plays my, uh, I play her younger sister and um, she died in the first movie if you saw Chantilly Lace, but she narrates beautifully this whole movie. And she's such a presence in it. You know, when you, every time I see her in the movie, I want to see more of her, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's just so compelling. And um, I knew Joe Beth a little bit because her husband, uh, John Pasquin, it's like, you know, this extraordinary television director. He's one of the best out there. I mean, he uh, started Home Improvement the first two years he did it. And he also did Roseanne and Growing Pains and Last Man Standing and a whole bunch of other things. So very wealthy person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you do the pilot, you're set. Uh, but um, I, I loved John and I met Joe Beth a couple of times through, through John. And then Jill, I had met through my friend Jody Long because Jody did uh, Michael Tucker, Jill's husband's play. And they did it like three times. They did the O'Neill, then they did it in New Jersey, and then they took it to New York. And I, I'm a friend, I saw all three. And um, um, and so I met Jill a couple, because Jill was, of course, in all of these incarnations of the show. Um, Jill is the reason I have this job. Because Jill, uh, they, they, Linda called Jill and said, who can we get to be a younger Joe Beth Williams? And uh, Jill talked to her agent and the agent, I don't even know who this person is, suggested me. And what was what they didn't know was that um, back in the, I don't know if it was late 70s or early 80s when I was still in New York, I went to a show at American Place Theater, getting ready to walk in. I see Chris Durang, the playwright, who I didn't know real well. I'd met him. But, you know, and I at that point, I didn't have bangs. 
you know? <laughs> and my hair was was you know that time in the 80s when it was all curly and big you know so my hair was curly and big and dark and we're walking into the theater and chris goes i really loved your work in poltergeist <laughs> <laughs> and he knows her he knows me and i i didn't know i can't even remember now whether i went uh, uh no I'm, I'm not her i i don't even remember i remember just being really shocked and kind of wandering into the theater <laughs> being very complimented by the way because of course joe beth is so gorgeous um but anyway so i i i've always wanted every time i would see joe beth you know parties and stuff i always used to think you know we really should play sisters in something mm -hmm. you know i was really looking forward to working with her which unfortunately this time i didn't get to do right but i i want to talk about these are um, at least what, let me see, Ali, Ali Sheedy came back, Lindsay Krauss, uh, Talia Shire, Jill Eikenberry, um, and then uh, Helen Slater. And now Helen has a daughter in the film, and she is now married to Joe Beth's ex-husband, which was something that came up in the Chantilly Lace movie. And um, and now she's, you know, shown up and, and actually... Uh, the character of her husband is so talked about in this film that you start to get a sense of who he is. Um, but um, I liked, I think I must, as just as an audience person, I think people pick different, because we all have our particular story or kind of theme we're running through. And I related so much to Helen, not in the communication problems with her daughter and just about every woman I know that has a daughter <laughs> <laughs> the same problem really really i'm so comforted oh, by yes. that i think we all do it one and then i start talking to some of my other girlfriends at, at dawn and i'm like oh i'm so relieved <laughs> i think we can all relate to that what you know just to set it up a little bit for the listeners because bridge and i have both seen the movie it's wonderful and one of the things that we really found fascinating is that you weren't given a particular script to read off you kind of were given parameters it wasn't really a script it really wasn't it was improv and what it was was an outline and we knew what every scene was going to be and what should basically happen in that scene okay this scene we're going through uh my mother's things and i'm giving them out and then we're then talking about whatever um there are other scenes where linda would go and secretly tell one person something that they were going to say or bring up that none of the rest of us knew were coming was coming like wow uh, like the thing at the end i won't say what it is you know at the very end with um helen and her daughter that we had no idea that was coming oh you know, wow no mm -hmm. idea that whole plot line was coming up so the, all of us were sitting there going oh okay <laughs> uh, uh you know and it was so wonderful because that was what kind of was happening all the time. And, and because we're coming up with stories of our own, sometimes um, it was pretty funny. You know, I mean, when Helen came up with that, never mind, I won't go on. Uh, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, <laughs> the sexual fantasy line. It was like, uh, we all completely lost it. You know, we, we really, and we were really losing it because we hadn't heard it and we couldn't believe she said it. And, and so uh, that is such an alive part of this movie because it is so alive and in the moment. And we did have to go back and then repeat sometimes what was she has the first time. And then mm -hmm. we'd have to then go back and we're, you know, uh, you know experienced enough actors where we can go back and and, and do the same reaction. Do yeah. <laughs> oh, do wow. But all through the movie, you have probably a lot of that first response to things we didn't know. And, you know, like all I knew was that when I went into this was that I was the ugly duckling of the girl. You know, my sister was famous. My mother was famous. My mother was a big, famous commercial actress and film actress. And 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 um, Joe Beth's character had been... Um, uh, a film reviewer who then later went into another kind of uh, TV journalism, but was also quite famous. And I was just the loser sister. And I wasn't really close with my sister, Jo Beth, and I, n n not really to my mother either, you know, and, um, and, and I don't know these women really. I mean, you know how you are with your sister's friends. Mm -hmm. They're, they're really nice to you, but they're not your friends. They're her friends. And, so when everybody's first arriving and we have those first scenes, 
I'm still dealing with, uh, I've just gotten here and my mother's died and all of the complex things around that. And then welcoming them and thanking them for helping me do the house. And I'm kind of not one of them. And um, so there's that. And then as the movie goes along, we go three months later and then six months later, by the end of the movie, they have been so warm and welcoming to me uh, that I really feel a part. And, and, and they, that's why they're with me there at the end where they, where I really need them. And um, I, I, the people, the, if, if people go to Rotten Tomatoes, we were not able to get the big uh, critics, which was really kind of insulting. When we opened in New York at the Angelica, the Times, the, they were all like, well, there's too many other movies opening and we don't have time to come review you. And I thought, hmm, does that have anything to do with a bunch of older actresses and women? Yeah. <laughs> men, you know, and it's women talk women talking had bigger stars and big bigger direct, you know. And um, you know, I it, it it was kind of to me that's very insulting and they should have done it. Uh, but you can look at there are a few reviews that are like you know, mixed to good from reviewers you probably never heard of. And and then, but I think the audience reviews are are important and great, and I think we're at like one place we're at like ninety percent, another a place we're at ninety six percent for audience, and the the comments are really great, and it's what we've heard you know from people who've come, and and so I'm really hoping that you can go on Amazon, Amazon Prime, Apple, iTunes, I think now Netflix, anything on demand. DirecTV, Verizon, whatever, Voodoo, you know, which always sells and rents movies. So it's kind of everywhere on demand. And you just, but you have to, because it's not in the top 10, you have to just go into search and search Chantilly Bridge. And then hopefully soon, um, Linda will bring back Lin uh, Chantilly Lace as well. And they'll be able to run both of them together, which would be really fun. That You'll would get be to great. See the women in our film, you see them 30 years ago. And, and you might recognize them more from, I mean, you'll recognize Jill Eikenberry from LA Law. When you see her young, you'll go, oh my God, yeah. And Talia, of course. And, but you see them young and it's, I think it's an incredible thing to be able to have that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But in addition to the fact that they're so good, these women. They're, yeah, but, great, great actresses. And, you know, um, Joe Beth was telling us too, just like you were talking about. Oh, you they, talked to Joe Beth. Yes. Oh, right. yes. Yes. She was telling us how in the first movie, how the death scene went about, like how you all drew straws. <laughs> well, drew. They did. I wasn't yeah, there. They she you were there. That's, that. right. That's right. That's right. You're about yeah. it. Yes. Yes. I, yes. It, what a shock it must have been for her to, to you know, to get that. But uh -huh. then, oh, gosh, I think it was it was because uh, I saw it years ago and I haven't been able to see it since because I, you know, it's not around. Right. And so I just kind of had to go off my memory of seeing it back in the mm -hmm. 90s when I was there. And um, um, it was I remember really loving it. And, you know, Hillary Clinton had a slumber party in the White House to show Chantilly Lace all those years ago. And so we're trying to figure out a way to get to Hillary Clinton and say, do you want to have to see this movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you see this movie and maybe tell people about it too? We yes. need a really big famous person to get behind the film and, and help oh. us push it. There's yeah. always Jill Biden. You could get, <laughs> Jill Biden, to. yes. <laughs> I guess none of us are really, you know, we're all like, you know, older women in the business, hard to get a job. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, you know, it's, I, I've been doing a lot of, of, you know, interviews, but nothing like, you know, no talk shows or anything. That's a With, shame. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, you know, it's interesting because I was reading some of the reviews that people were posting and such positive responses. And one of them that stuck out for me was one that said it was a genuine love letter to female friendship. It is. It, in fact, that's made, what made me sad, you know, yeah. because I, I mean, I have female friendships, but none of my, I have this friend back on the East coast and this really close friend here, and they don't really know each other. And, you know, so, and then these other close friends here that don't know this other friend here, it's not like a group, you know, um, and, and, uh, and certainly not a group that goes back all those years and knows you so well, mm -hmm. um, knew your parents, knew your, you know, the whole, uh, Talia's yeah. character is very close to my mother in the film, if you remember. And, and there's a little bit for me, I, you know, this is the kind of thing you find in the process of a scene, you know, while we were doing the scene and she was 
I wasn't really aware that she was so close to my mother or so near my mother in her days when she was sick or ill and right there. And, and I have the, I, I see myself doing this reaction that I didn't, I wasn't even aware that I was doing where Talia says something about my mom. And I'm like, oh, great. You had a relationship with her. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's one of the hard things for me in that first scene, it, you know, is um because I I'm still kind of struggling with all of that. And um, but I think my character has a huge arc in the film, and 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 many of them do, I think, which is another thing that's always interesting to watch. And and because there's wonderful, funny surprises, in addition to things that will suddenly move you. Um, I just think it's like, oh gosh, it's my favorite kind of film where you don't know that you're about to laugh or you don't know that you're about to cry. So your defenses are all down. You're not like going to see Eugene O'Neill. And so, you know, you're going to see something heavy and you go there steeled against it. You know, you go and go, <laughs> oh, this is going to be a real bummer. <laughs> you're you know? preparing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go, or if you go to a comedy, you're like, make me laugh. You're going to make me laugh. You know, if you just expect, if you don't know what to expect, that was the essence of what Chekhov always used to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, he has a character come and do a big, serious tirade at somebody. And then he walks off stage and you hear he's just falling down the stairs, you know? So it was, it, it's life, mm-hmm. you know? And, yeah. and I, I don't know. I just think Linda and Linda wrote things like the letter that I read and the, and the thing. And, um, and of course, all of the narration that Joe Beth uh, does and, um, and every scene was, there was like, okay, this is the scene with, so this is what it's about. This is where you are. Go. Wow. I think, you know? And you were, you seem like you were perfect for that. When you talk about how your relationship, how you grew up with the friends and you were scattered. Yeah. And- And, and then you're the kind of outlier, but yeah, I was, you know, that's perfect. You were really a great fit because if you had this relationship where you were kind of the outlier, (laughs) oh, she didn't know you were, we didn't know each other before. And, oh, um, wow. Wow. So uh, I I don't think she was really aware of, um, you know, I grew up pretty lonely actually, because I had three sisters and the two older ones were horrible to me and my younger one was too much younger. So I was horrible to her. And so, and we were moving. So you're moving to a new place and the only people you have are your family. And my sisters, you know. I have nine, so I know. I have nine sisters. Yeah. Oh my God. No, no boys at all. Two boys, two boys. There were 12 oh, kids. See, my, they kept trying and being oh. disappointed and, and they finally gave up. After I have three sisters, so I get you it. Do? There's four of us, but yeah. I'm the youngest. Yeah. Oh, I'm number three, which is the bad place to be. You don't want to be the middle kid. No. Well, my I'm sis- number 11. My, <laughs> my middle ones were twins. So it was like. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So well, they kind of had older sh- than. There are the twins are four years and then my oldest sister is six years. So okay, I was kind me, of different. Tell me this. Did your twin sisters bond with each other more or did one of them maybe bond with one of the other sisters more than her twin? The, definitely the twins bonded more. The twins See, bond. I have twins, but my twins are boy girl and um, you know, I tried to have them in different classes. They went to the same school, but I tried to have them in the same classes and never have them do anything. But, you know, it was really difficult, um, yeah. between them, you know, mm. um, they you know, it's gotten much better now that they're 32 and my mm-hmm. daughter is actually getting married in a week and a half. Oh, oh my Congratulations. goodness. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. We're, so yes. we're so lucky. Uh, he's, she's been with this guy for like almost 10 years. We all adore him. And my daughter-in-law is perfect uh-huh. i mean you could not ask for a better mother for your grand she's a much better mother than i was and <laughs> really i'm like i wish i had been more like you um <laughs> she's awesome and and we're so uh, lucky that the two people that have come in to the family so yeah. far are somebody that we all love and adore and it's so, interesting yeah. isn't so it cool. it's yeah she, my, she's um, got a child my theory. daughter yeah. got married about a year and a half ago and it's the same thing they were together for seven or eight years and he just meshes well in but i don't have boys i have two girls so i don't know how that dynamic of a daughter and, well uh, girls yeah. are harder <laughs> now you know it's so funny my mother thought it was easier for, with girls our, our our boys were so spoiled well the middle one so it, one was a twin to a girl uh, he was the second, and then he was a twin oh, to a girl. Both had twins. 
Yeah. Yeah. In our families. And, and here you are with twins and, but the middle boy smack down in, in the middle of those girls, spoiled rotten, spoiled. <laughs> had his own room while they were like you double know, bunk beds in another room. <laughs> we all knew that dad would love, you know, dad was a Navy test pilot. He was super macho. He was really athletic. He was dying to have one of us be an athlete because he didn't have a boy. So he would kind of try to get us, you know, and my sister was playing golf for a while and she just had a natural swing and he was so happy. And then <laughs> as soon as she didn't have a crush on that boy anymore. She didn't want to play golf anymore. And he was just like, what, what, what? but you had to swing. You know? <laughs> and, and the thing is, it was, he would have been a terrible father for a boy. Um, he really would have been. And, you know, he, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, you know, military parents sometimes, you know, think that they can apply military stuff to the way they're raising their children. You know, my dad used to say, if I tell you to jump off a 20 story building, you jump off and you don't ask me why you do it. You know, because I have a good, you assume I have a good reason for telling you to do it. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no way I'm going to do that. He said, okay, we're in a car. And I see something coming right at your windshield. You don't see it. I tell you to duck. You duck. I say, mm, no, probably not. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was like, he, you know, they're, they're always, both my parents were also military brats. And so there's this whole kind of ingrained discipline thing. But the good part of it is that we were, we did become religious at one point just because my father became an Episcopalian. And so we all trooped around to Episcopalian and we were all in the choir and the altar guild and da, da, da. but where I, I'm not religious at all now, where I got my, I have a pretty strong uh, ethics and uh, moral sense and always have. And I really have trouble with people who lie, which is really <laughs> stupid to me because everybody dies. Uh, but, <laughs> but it, it's be from the military. Oh, you know, I yeah. think it's, you know, we grew up with the sense of service, you know, of, of uh, serving other people, which is why I've done 10 years on the Cure PSB board and 10 years on the union. And, you know, because you feel this like, well, I'm not doing, I'm not giving anything. I'm not doing anything I'm supposed to be. Um, but, um, but there, there's that, I don't know. There's just this sense of honor that we were raised with that mm -hmm. wasn't religious. It was, you know, some of it was, you know, patriotic, but not jingoistic patriotic. We didn't grow up with that. Nothing mm -hmm. like you see now. My dad was kind of like whoever if he he felt was best, but then he would, he'd find out who we wanted. And then he, just to tease us, he would act like he was for the other person just to make us mad. <laughs> oh man, oh, that would have really been bad. I see, I was the one that argued with him all the time. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. No, my that sister, was me. My first that sister was me. Was terrified of him. Did everything he said. He was terrified of him. My second okay. sister just snuck around behind his back and lied and snuck and got caught because she was yeah. not very bright and she was always getting caught. And so then along comes me and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's a stupid rule. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's so funny. The dynamics like within our because, you know, there were ours were 12 kids. So I'm toward the end. And by the time they got to me, they were exhausted. I can't believe your <laughs> mother had 12 kids. 12 kids. Yeah. My niece has nine, but she adopted six of them. Yeah. Oh, my. That is, I had two. After, And I love it. I loved having the big family. I love, I saw some of them yesterday. Yeah, I you're very them. close with all of them. Very, That's great. I'm very close, but in my, before my mother passed away, I had my two and I kind of felt like, this is good. I've got a boy and a girl. I'm good. And oh, Bridget, you could always have another baby. You know, I was 40 when I had you. And I'm like, I'm good, mom. I'm really good. Well, I don't need nine. I don't need 12. I'm nine too. I'm I'm good. Good. We're replacing ourselves. Remember population over population. <laughs> yes. Right? You, know? How hard, you know, it's interesting. How hard was it? You had just had the twins when you started home improvement. Oh gosh. How hard was that? It was really hard because I had a high risk pregnancy and I ended up in bed the last at least four months. And, um, yeah. And so then they were born and we were, I was they were born three weeks early and there were 15 pounds of twins Wow! because it turned out I was diabetic in the pregnancy. So you have really huge babies. So, um, so then like right away, they started with the colic, both of them. So then the first, as they say, three months, it, it was just colic, colic, colic. And my ex-husband now, ex-husband and I were like, 
all the time up all night walking. One would take one, one would take the other, walking them and trying to, and there was just nothing you can do really. And and then it stopped just as it's supposed to at three months. And then just when it stopped, like a week later, we're finally sleeping through the night. <laughs> and and I was already signed with Disney and ABC to do a dramedy that was written by the people who did the Wonder Years. And it was called, it was called Home Movies, ironically. And I was going to do it with Danny Stern first. We were a young couple who just had a baby. And um, and so then Danny, got, got, he got something and so he couldn't do it. So then Paul Reiser was going to do it. And then his Cadillac movie came, Cadillac Man movie came out. And he was like, no, I'm going to have a film career. I don't want to do this. So then he didn't do it. And then they brought in Michael Chiklis to read with me. And, and then they gave the commission to him. So I still didn't have a husband, but I didn't care because we weren't going to start working on that until like September, October. And this is March or, you know, so um, I, I just thought, oh, great. That gives me more time to lose the weight and be with babies. And, you know, that's what I wanted. And then one day uh, my agent calls and says, they've canceled home movies. Now they'd already given me a holding fee. And, and I was like, Oh, and so they could hold me until December, which is now March, right? And keep me from doing anything else. And so they said, but Disney wants you to start tomorrow on a show called Home Improvement and replace someone. And they were going to shoot the pilot. This was Wednesday. They were going to shoot the pilot Friday. Now they will shoot it the following Tuesday and you'll rehearse Thursday, Friday, maybe Saturday, Monday, do camera blocking and, and Tuesday shoot it. And I hadn't worked in a year because of, you know, the pregnancy and all that. And so I, I was like, I didn't want to do another sitcom. I'd already done three. And I really didn't, I'd always avoided playing a wife because they're always thankless parts. And, and so I was like, eh, I don't want to do a thankless wife part. Eh, I don't want to do that. And, and they sent me, um, they said, okay, well, this guy's really great. And I had never heard of him. He had had a Showtime special, but other than that. So they sent that to me and Ray. And we watched it. And Ray, of course, being a man who does a lot of building, loved it and laughed his ass off. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's, he's good. He's pretty funny. He, you know, he's a, he's a guy guy thing. But, you know, he's, he seems good. And then they told me the, the clincher, which was that the producers were the original producers for Roseanne, that they'd created it. And it was my favorite show. I adored her. And uh, I just liked her. I mean, I adored her as a mother and a wife. At, every time she came on a commercial, I was like, how great to see somebody real talking in a real way and not trying to look like Donna Reed. And, you, you know, I, I was mm -hmm. just, and it's okay for her to be so smart and blunt. And you know, I thought it was fantastic. So when I heard it was them, then I went, okay, I'm going to go talk to them. So I went and talked to them. They lied to me for like an hour or two about what the show was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Really? Not, oh, it's going to be about both of them. It's just as much about this book, You Don't Understand by Deborah Tannenbaum, as it is about Iron John. We can't just have a show about a guy blowing up things all the time. He has to have somebody to push against. And 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 so you, it's feminism against masculinism. And so you'll have family and friends and you're uh, you're going to get a job and you'll have, you know, so I thought it would be more like mad about you. Mm -hmm. And oh, then okay. the whole first year, they wouldn't let me do a scene by myself unless Tim came into it. Oh, uh, you know, I, and, and I couldn't understand it. I was there being really complimentary about my work, but they wouldn't trust me in a scene unless Tim was in it. And so I, I would start it after a while at this, by the second year, I, I didn't mind the first year because I had babies in the dressing room the whole time. And I was so happy to be with them anytime I could. I was like, great, fine. And, but by the second year, I'm like, are they ever going to develop this character? And so every time I would ask this one producer, his response would be, but the audience loves you. And I go, okay, so why are you not developing her? But the audience loves you. It was a circular conversation, not ever getting anywhere. And, um, and and then I just sort of realized the Tim Allen show. But uh, we had new producers come in the next year. The, the original three went away and these new guys came in. And Elliot Shoneman, who created the Bill Cosby show, was now our executive producer. And uh, I went in to talk to him and he knew I was pretty unhappy. And he said um, that we could they could do like maybe we did 25 shows a year that we could do four or five that would be Jill driven shows. And that would at least give me something to look forward to where I wasn't always playing the same scene over and over and over again. And, um, and so that, that got me to stay. And, um, and then, you know, I, I always, every year I had, uh, you know, a couple of shows that 
were challenging and were interesting to do. I doubt we're talking about home improvement too much, are we? I no, know, not at no. all. But yeah. you know, I, I know I, you want to talk about menopause. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. since that's but in the title. Um, <laughs> I was but you're, you're, lucky. That's a cool topic. So, so yeah, that's your a, your story is a cool topic. Yeah. One one oh. interesting thing with home improvement was that, and I had heard you speak about this. It, it was a room full of men. And then you go to Chantilly Bridge and it's a room full of women. Actually, then that? I went to Strong Medicine, which was a woman's ER. Oh, and that's okay. why I, I took it partially because it wasn't a seven-year contract. And I didn't want to be away from my kids that long ever again. And so uh, I took it because they gave me three years and a four-day week. And only one of those days I had the kids. And so I, it, it was so hard for me to do both. I'm very tunnel visioned, you know? And so it was really always really hard for me to make sure that I was doing the best workout I could and not and not, and not forgetting the kids. And I didn't have help. I didn't have any live-in help because I didn't want another person I have to take care of. But also I didn't want that person between me and the kids. You know, like on the weekends and, and at night, I just wanted to be alone with them. And if you have that live-in help, there's always a stranger in your midst. It, it's not the same, but it's a little harder, you know, to, um, to make sure that you're covering everything. And, uh, and, and home improvement was a very demanding job. We were, we had much longer days than any other sitcom in town. Um, well, you know, all the things involved on that show. I mean, all the little whatever. Uh, well, we we wrote yeah. almost every day, uh, every, you know, and we were writing on our feet sometimes. And, oh. and Tim and I had input into the script every Monday as soon as the first read through was over. Then we would go in. And at first, and that's, you probably heard me talking about that. I was so intimidated. I, I'd been years in New York and here being the actor on the lowest part of the totem pole and the idea of um, telling a producer, writer, this isn't working, this is not good. You know, where's the story? If you're just going for jokes, where, you know, this you need, you know, you're the ones that are telling all the other writers. They literally gave the writers baseball hats that said, what's the story? And we're really trying to focus on that. But then, you know, as time went on, we got more and more scripts that were just be. I'd be like, okay, guys, I finally got my nerve out. Okay, you have four plots. You could only have two. You have A story, B story. Wilson scene has to be about one of those. You can't then have A story, B story, C story, <laughs> and then have the Wilson story about one of these other minor ones. It's got to be that. That's the the structure of the show. And and the structure is also, what do we want? What are we trying to get? What is happening? And how are we dealing with that? It's not about setting up a joke you can see a million miles away coming, which we started getting. And um, and so that's, you know, I got in trouble for saying something about that on the e. Hollywood True Story. And then unfortunately, they decided to make me the bad guy of that whole piece because they couldn't get Jonathan in and they were going to pick on him. But uh, and they uh, they when they cut it, they cut everything, making it look like I had been demanding more from my part, which I didn't have to do. I was already getting at least four shows a year. I was never advocating for myself to be in more. I was advocating for the script to be about story and character and not about jokes. I mean, to me, humor comes out of the other things, you know. Uh, it, so, um, but, you know, the e. Hollywood True Story really kind of screwed me up because they made me look really bad. Oh, gosh. Um, but um, I, I did not see that one. So there. <laughs> yeah. I was doing West Wing when it came out. And I remember talking to Lawrence O'Donnell one night and we were leaving the stage and Lawrence wrote all of my episodes because I was the Republicans. You know, we were like I did like nine episodes of that. And we were all the Republicans. And he wrote all he wrote a lot of the Republican episodes. And uh, I wrote Matt and I said, this Hollywood story thing has come out and I think it's totally screwing up my whole career. It makes me look so bad. And And I said, I'm just, you know, really hoping that nobody's watching it and Lawrence being so comforting he says oh that's what we all watch in the middle of the night when we can't sleep we all watch it then it's like three o'clock in the morning we all watch it I'm like okay so I'll never work thanks, again thanks Lawrence uh, yeah well, I, I was like uh, uh, West Wing uh, is one of my favorite shows oh yeah ever I I just I love I was so Lawrence. honored and still so honored to have ever been in it unfortunately my dad was dying all during oh. the time that it was happening. And in fact, died in the middle of one of the episodes. The day oh. after I met John Spencer, I had to go fly and be with my father his last four days. And and then the next day we were having a dinner at my aunt's house and my publicist called me and said, John Spencer had died. 
Oh, and oh yeah. Oh, I had just awful. met him. He had been that was so awful. sweet to me. He was the nicest person. And by the way, everyone on that set worshipped him, loved him. Oh. And he had had a heart attack before. And so they all started blaming themselves because they we shouldn't have given him this plot line. It was too much for him. He insisted he could do it, but it was too much work. And then they're feeling guilty. And it was they were so upset. And so when I went, we had to go back to another episode. We had to rewrite the whole election part two. And uh and had to go back and do that when I was still, you know, pretty rocked. And I walk into like uh, rooms full of people who are so grief stricken and just trying to deal, you know, and that was the rest of the season. Everybody was just trying to deal with getting through the rest of the season while carrying this grief, you know? So I, I tell people sometimes that if I still have to go to gate seven at Warner brothers, I have a kind of PTSD, you know, it's like I, I drive through to eight, seven, that, you know, the, that gate. And I'm like, oh, you know, remembering those last episodes of, you know, having to go there and, and do it. Now I have to thank again, Alan Alda and Stephen Root, who were so funny and dear. Ron Silver is now passed. Um, who were so dear during all this time when they knew this was going on and they, they, I would just go and try to forget about it and they would be funny and, and oh, they were so great and, and got me through it. And Alan Alda is a prince among men. I've heard that from, uh, we've heard that from Bess Armstrong as well. Didn't we? Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. 